please welcome Conrad Lee, who will be holding a talk on privacy invasion or innovative science. A round of applause. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, can you hear me in the back? Is it okay? Okay, thanks. So I'm going to put into question the current privacy stance that many academics have towards uh, public social media data sets. So I want to make two points. The first is that privacy issues are preventing a leap forward in the study of human behavior. And more specifically, uh, they're doing so by preventing the collection and public dissemination of high quality data sets. The second point I want to make is that in many situations, the current behavior of, of academics in sharing these data sets uh, is, I think, too sensitive to policy, to privacy. Uh, and this is because privacy on many of these sites is an illusion. And it's not an illusion that ap academics need to propagate. Okay, so this is a, I'm not a privacy researcher. Uh, I use social media data sets and uh, to research how things spread through social networks. So this isn't a theoretical talk, it's just going to outline some of the issues I've faced in my own research. So here's an outline. Um, first I'll motivate the whole thing on why these social media data sets are interesting, how they will help us make new discoveries about human behavior. And perhaps the most interesting data sets would be those that could come from Facebook. All right, so I'll go over why that's the case. And there was uh, an attempt to create a very interesting data set from Facebook called the Taste, Ties, and Time data set. And I'll go over that and why that project sort of failed in the end. And to put the whole thing into context, I need to also introduce the evil twin of Taste, Ties, and Time, the Facebook 100 data set. Okay, and. Then I'll put into question the current attitude towards sharing data from social media sites. And um, I'll end just with one slide on some more questions that are coming up by that uh, originate from the ability to infer user attributes based on a social network. So even if you don't uh, tell a social network, if you, even if you leave many profile fields blank, these can be filled in. Um, and this raises additional privacy concerns. Okay, so a sociologist at Harvard um, in a New York Times interview said, we're on the cusp of a new way of doing social science. Our predecessors could only dream of the kind of data we have now. And why is that? So there are some stubborn questions that sociologists haven't been able to answer, uh, such as do tastes or beliefs determine who you be become friends with? Um, or is it the other way around? Do our friends influ influence us and do they determine our taste in a way? And are there opinion leaders? Is there a small minority of people who are responsible for convincing the people around them um, of what they should think? And there are many other questions that have to do with contagion and diffusion uh, in social networks, such as is obesity contagious? This was a recent result. Um, that drew a lot of media attention, that if your friends become fat, you're at a higher risk of becoming fat too. So these questions are increasingly not only studied by sociologists, but also physicists and computer scientists um, who use models from their fields to try to answer these questions. Okay, and the reason we're on the cusp of this revolution um, is not due to new methods also due to new methods, but mainly due to the data that's available. And the data on many social media websites is especially interesting for three reasons. You have a social network, this interaction network. On Facebook, you can think of the friendships. On Twitter, there's a following relationship. So many of these uh, social media websites include the ability to interact with users, and that's all recorded. And crucially, this network data is revealed or observed rather than obtained through a survey. So. Uh, sociologists have been looking at social network data for a long time now, but traditionally the, re the social network would be based on a survey. And it turns out that if I ask most of you here, who are the 30 people you interact with most, um, you wouldn't provide a very accurate list. It would differ from the list if someone actually followed you around and uh, looked at who you interacted with. 
So if you're a cell phone service provider, um, they will actually maybe have a better idea. They'll be able to provide a more accurate list, or Facebook, for example, could. Um, and then, of course, the state is on a much larger scale than has been traditionally possible to collect. And finally, uh, the data is collected over a long period of time. And all these features are important uh, to answer these stubborn questions that have been, uh, have been posed for some time without uh, much progress. So where is the data? At this point, social media websites have been popular for a decade or so, or nearly, and there still aren't carefully curated data sets for researchers. Um, data reuse is still the exception rather than the norm. Um, often, the data is shared for a little while and then it's pulled down at the request of a site like Twitter. Um, and this leads to many problems, and this is what's really holding back um, progress towards answering these questions. Uh, so the first most major problem is that of re replicability. So uh, I mentioned before this recent finding that obesity is contagious across friendship ties. And this finding is highly contentious and there are uh, other economists who have shown this probably isn't the case. But the whole thing can't really be settled because original data set this, this was based on which in this case wasn't a social media data set, but this would be true of the same, this would also be true for many findings based on social media. Um, th this couldn't be tested, really. Uh, it's hard to refute an idea if you don't have access to the original data. And also it's very hard to build up incrementally as a field without these shared data sets. Um, uh, you can't say, well, this person discovered this about this data set, building on that, building on the communities they found or the structures that they found, um, we're going to take it a step further. And finally, uh, it's very inefficient for every research group or every PhD student to have to rate their own scrapers and figure out how to find loopholes in the APIs of these sites to collect the data that they need. Um, and it's also inefficient from the sense that if you want to collect a data set pro properly, uh, respecting the privacy of users, um, there's a lot of extra overhead with that that many research groups won't have the resources for. Um, or they, they might be in a rush and so they don't um, respect all of these issues. So it would be more efficient if we just collected one data set properly. Um, the obstacles to that are obviously the ethical questions is of privacy, basically, and also the other obstacle would be the threat of service providers. So I'll show later on that in some cases people's privacy have already been compromised. Um, so the, the ethical issue is, is no longer really the main issue. The, the main issue is that a site like Twitter says, take this data set down, it, sort of threateningly. Okay, and there are people, many research groups do share data sets, it does happen, but um, they're lacking, so there are some sites, say, uh, you can think of Flickr as an example, where pe there is a, an interaction network, um, people, it is longitudinal, it's large scale, it has many of the properties I listed before, but the data set's not very interesting in general because it doesn't capture people's social universe very well. Their, their most important relationships, their best friends and their family won't be represented in this interaction network. Uh, ideally, you would have a data set from something like a, an isolated village of people using, who all had smartphones and all use their social media site, so you could track back changes in user behavior to uh, your original data. So if someone changes their political opinions, you can find the cause for that change within the data set that you have. So. Of course, there are shared data sets, um, but there hasn't been one that sort of a, a canonical, a, a very important data set of general use. Uh, well, there actually, there has been one that was collected, this taste, ties, and time data set, which I'll go over now. Um, but for privacy reasons, uh, it is not being distributed publicly. So, this data set was from a relatively socially, well, self-contained social group. It was collected on freshman students in, going into a U.S. private university where people would come from all over the country, sort of sever their existing social ties and be living in this little isolated college community. And another nice 
uh, aspect of this data set was that it's from Facebook, and college students at the time very heavily used Facebook. So if you were friends with somebody in college, it's very likely that that friendship would show up in this data set. Um, and the group that collected this data, they had the resources to manually annotate it, to get people to look at each profile and say, well, if this field wasn't filled in, if, um, if their gender wasn't filled in, they can look at the picture and tell what the gender is. And so manually enrich this data set. Okay, and the, this taste, ties, and time data contained information on gender, socioeconomic status, race, academic major, um, the things sociologists believe are in, play an important role in many of these uh, fundamental questions. And it also included information on what people's favorite books were, their favorite bands, films, etc. So in many ways, it was an unprecedented data set. It was collected from a small university in New England. And it was co collected uh, over four years. And according to the terms of the funding, it had to be made public. The ethical aspects of the study were approved by the Harvard uh, in Institutional Research Board, and Facebook also was aware of this study and approved of it. So there were measures taken to preserve the privacy of the users involved. Their names were removed and contact information was removed, and many of the attributes, say your favorite band, uh, so if you had if one user had some a few rare attributes, it might be easy to re-identify them. So rather than telling you what the the favorite books or bands were, they encoded them with numbers. So you would know if two people had a book in common, but you wouldn't know what that book was. Nevertheless, uh, the anonymity of the data set was quickly and easily cracked um, in the sense that it was, uh, people discovered where the data was coming from. It was from the Harvard class of 2009. So the researchers who were collecting this data were also from Harvard. Um, so there were some, after this data set was cracked, there were some serious criticisms of the whole study. And the first is that the, the subjects weren't ever informed that their profiles were being scraped. And so there was no way to opt out of this study. And the second is that the profiles were being scraped from the privileged positions of other, like, fellow students. So the researchers in charge of this study hired students at the university to collect this data. So at the time, Facebook had sort of a three-tier privacy um, policy. You could share your profile and your friends with only your friends, or you could share that with the whole network, which in this case was a college, or globally. And most people chose to share things with the whole network. So um, the people collecting this data had privileged access to data that the users themselves might have thought was pretty private. And then this, this data set was going to be released to the public. So those are some of the serious privacy criticisms that arose. And the data set was pr uh, quickly yanked down from their website. Um, Here's a note from 2010. It's still offline as we take further steps to, to make this data set anonymous, and this, there's still no updates since then. Um, I haven't heard of it being on BitTorrent. It was apparently released for a little while, but um, I haven't seen it anywhere. So now I'm going to talk about the Facebook 100, which is what I call it the evil twin of this uh, taste, ties, and time data set. Here's, it was actually 100 different college um, friendship networks. Here's a visualization of the Caltech network, which is one of the smaller ones. And this data set appeared in early 2011, uh, although the data itself originates from September 2005. There's also a smaller data set released a few years ago called the Facebook Five, uh, which was released, was, which was gathered a little bit earlier. And this data came directly from Facebook. It came from the CTO of Facebook, Adam D'Angelo. Uh, that's what the paper that introduced this data says. And so for 100 universities, we have the complete friendship network, and we have data on gender, dorm, academic major, and the high school that the user attended. So the friendship, one interesting point is that the friendship network is complete regardless of the privacy settings. Um, so the 
the user said they only want their friends to know about this, uh, about their friendship network and their profile. Uh, it didn't matter. Facebook just included everything, basically. And they did take some measures to try to keep this data anonymous. They removed the names and they, again, they encoded the attributes. So you wouldn't know if someone was male or female. There was gender one and two. Um, and yeah, so all those attributes had the same encoding. Okay, now there's an interesting question of could this data set be cracked without much additional information? And yes, it could. There was a, that reference should say, uh, there's a paper from uh, Kleinberg and I think it was Backstrom. Um, and they were able to show that even if you have a huge network of, say, everyone in Facebook now, or even if included everyone in the world, um, you could, if before the data had been collected, you had implanted, say, five or between five and ten nodes in that network and created some random connections between them, you could efficiently f find those nodes in the anonymized data set. And from there, you could de-anonymize uh, more of the network. And even if you didn't actively create accounts to, for this kind of privacy attack, if you just had information about your network before it was collected, um, it's very likely that you'd be able to find yourself again. So theoretically, it's very difficult to anonymize social network data. Um, so I tried to identify myself in this. I happened to be a college student at the time when the uh, data was collected. And I, in half an hour, I still wasn't able to find myself. I narrowed myself down to about 15 people. Um, and then I started, then I just went to Google. And it's not really necessary to crack this data. Um, Google, one of the first hits said, well, actually, this, there seems to be a mistake with this data. The original Facebook IDs, there was one more node attribute called ID. And this probably wasn't supposed to be in the original data set, because uh, after this data set was released, there was a slightly appended, uh, uh, modified version that was released. And that one was missing this ID attribute. And then um, Facebook asked them to take the whole thing down altogether. So the original Facebook IDs are still contained in the data set. Um, if you're interested in downloading this data set, this one is on BitTorrent. Um, I've also created a parser for it if you want to put it into any of a number of network formats. So here's how easy it was here. It's how I found myself. I just went to Facebook, typed and searched the source code for user, and I found Oh, there's some number. It looks like a user ID. Went into the data set, and sure enough, there I was. So that's not too interesting. Um, could we find someone famous? So here's Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, if you type into Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg Facebook ID, uh, you'll find his ID is actually the lowest of all Facebook IDs. It's number four. So you can look in the Harvard network. It was one of the 100 networks included in this data set. And sure enough, there he is. He has 156 friends, um, which doesn't make him particularly popular in Harvard. Makes him 4,055th most popular person there. So it's easy to find people in this data set. Uh, you could probably write a scraper that would identify. There were 1.2 million people's accounts were in this Facebook 100 data set. And probably wouldn't be hard to identify a large number of those. Okay, so that puts this taste, ties, and time data set into context. So this data was pulled to protect the privacy of users. In the meantime, though, Facebook releases basically the data that's contained in that set anyway. So the Harvard network in 2005 is contained in this Facebook 100 data set. So there the user's privacy has already been quietly compromised. Most of the users aren't aware of this. So this brings up the question of why not, why don't we distribute the taste, ties, and time data set? Or similar data sets. This, isn't, this is just one example um, to be concrete, but there are other situations where data sets have been posted and then pulled down at the request of the provider. Um, so before delving into this question anymore, we should consider two conceptions of privacy. Uh, the first one is harm-based, so, and it, this one says if 
as long as no harm comes from the fact that I have your data, as long as I don't steal your identity or try to do anything with it that you would disapprove of if you really knew what I was doing, um, then uh, we haven't done anything ethically wrong. So academics who are uninterested in the identities of the individuals, so this is one important part, um, this is one important point. Academics in general, uh, they don't need to know the identities. They don't want to know the identities. They don't want to de-anonymize the network. They're just looking for patterns in the data. So according to this harm-based philosophy or conception of privacy, uh, this, we can use this data as academics and this, I would argue, is the, the conception of privacy that most academics work with. The other conception would be a dignity-based, uh, and both of these conceptions were in a paper from Zimmer in 2010. Uh, there's a bibliography at the end if you're interested in where these come from. Um, the dignity-based conception of privacy says that if the data is stripped out of its intended sphere, then you're already compromising the basic human dignity of the user. So if you have a data set with millions of people, um, you can bet that probably a few of them don't want their data researched by anyone, no matter what their, how benign it seems to the academics. So I would say most academics who are looking at large data sets uh, do not have this conception of privacy, otherwise they wouldn't be looking at the data sets. So most effective research environments have adopted this harm-based paradigm. So now another look at the current policy. You can exploit sensitive data for your own academic research. Um, for example, this taste, ties, and time data set is still being um, used by the Harvard researchers who gathered it. You just can't share it. And the ostensible explanation for this is that academic use is allowed because academics, we're, we're not interested in harming you. We aren't going to steal your identity. Uh, we don't even care about your identity. So. The reason we don't share it is so it won't be used maliciously by people who do want to do those things. And so the assumption here that holds us all together is that well, malicious users can't collect this data themselves. So as long as we don't distribute it, your privacy will be maintained. Okay, so this, um, it's not only in this Facebook data set where privacy has been compromised, of course. There are a lot of the social media data sets that have been shared and other data sets like the Netflix Prize data set, um, they've been cracked in a way so that users could be re-identified. So this is a persistent problem in this field. Um, and it, it basically boils down to the fact that it's hard to maintain privacy and accessibility for users simultaneously. Um, so another example in Germany, there was a network before Facebook became popular here, or was translated into German, there was StudiVZ, and that was notoriously insecure. In 2007, uh, I think it was an undergraduate student at the Technical University in Munich, scraped the entire StudiVZ friendship network. Um, and others have scraped that one as well. It's, so there's an illusion here, people believe their data is more private than it is. Um, and there are also cases where so to scrape the StudiVZ data, you would need to log into StudiVZ, which means you've agreed to the terms and conditions which say you shouldn't scrape it. But there are other cases, um, for example, uh, blogger Pete Warden scraped 210 million profiles from public, basically data that Facebook had made public. And he didn't log into Facebook at all to do this. In fact, he even respected their no robots um, files. So he only scraped files that Facebook had seemingly showed was okay to be scraped. Uh, but although this data was completely public, Facebook threatened to sue P. Warden and he had to take it down. So um, the same could be said of other large um, Twitter data sets or Foursquare data sets or um, data from other social media sites. Okay, and of course the the leaks of data that uh, we really have to worry about uh, go unheard of. We don't know about malicious users because they don't try to publish and share their data. And of course the, the government also has access to a lot of data, which is something maybe users don't always think about. So why does this policy exist? Well, one way to answer this question is to think of who benefits from this policy. And it's not the users who are just less aware of the vulnerabilities by um, 
basically the fact that they can't be shared publicly. Uh, it's not science which is held back for the reasons I've already stated. The service providers benefit. Um, for example, Facebook or Twitter, they avoid bad press, they avoid lawsuits, um, and malicious users also benefit. They, the vulnerabilities of these social media websites remain unknown and users who aren't as aware of them are more confident to share sensitive information. So it seems one possible explanation for this, this current state where researchers aren't sharing their data, they're not trying to build these data sets, is that we're afraid of the, the wrath of the service providers such as Facebook. So uh, we can say we're not sharing it for privacy reasons, but if malicious users are likely to be able to access this data anyway, then why do we have to pretend like the site is private? Okay, uh, now I've simplified things a little. We should probably distinguish between three different cases. Um, one where data can be collected publicly without any agreement with the source of the data, so the social media site that it comes from. And in this case, I argue uh, there's no, uh, we should be sharing data. There's, it's public, um, it should be known that it's public. Um, if there's controversy that this data is being shared, it will only make the users more aware that the data that they've put out for the public um, has been scraped and can be scraped. The next case would be where it's easy to collect a lot of data within a certain website, but you have to log in to do it. You have to agree to the terms and conditions of the provider. And the third one would be where data has been shared privately with, with researchers. So this is a case with a lot of the mobile phone data research that's been done. The mobile phone providers share data with academics. And this, in this case, I would definitely say uh, academics should not be sharing the data sets because it's not available to malicious parties in the first place or not that we know of. It's not as easy to, for them to access. Okay, so, yeah, my point again is if service providers leak this data out easily, then why should academia pretend like we, it's hard for us to access or we can't share it? So, uh, if to return back to the concrete example of this taste, ties, and time data set, um, it's sort of a gray area. Uh, it would be hard for malicious users to collect this, to collect all the attributes that the, the researchers collected. So it would be hard, it would be possible for them. You would need a, an account in the Harvard network, which may not be that hard. You would need, uh, so I guess, to have a Harvard email address or to make Facebook think you had one. And they also did a lot of manual annotation on the data. So. Uh, it's, I, I will say it is sort of a gray case. It's not easy to deal with this problem. Okay, and now just one last slide on a host of other problems that come in if you try to enhance data sets. So there's been some research done on filling in things people leave blank on their profiles. So if you have a social network and you have some set of users, say you have 20% of users who fill in some attribute on their profile, say their gender, or the year that they graduate, or the year they're born in, then there's been research that shows it's, you can infer with high accuracy um, what the values are for the other 80% of the people. And another interesting example was some MIT researchers looking at the MIT Facebook network we were able to show that you can come up with a classifier, a machine learning classifier, in this case a logistic regression model, that can accurately predict whether a user is a gay man or not. So this is uh, basically, even if there's not even a field um, for it on the site or if you leave it blank, uh, your friends re reveal a lot about you um, if you're using a social media site. And the question is, how far should academia push this research? So should we try to enhance our data sets by um, trying to fill? If you have a data set and you're trying to do some research, it's really annoying when there are all these blank fields. You don't know what the gender of this person is. You don't know what the gender of that one is. So uh, using such classifiers, you can try to fill in all those blanks. And should we be doing that? 
And should we be coming up with methods that are that can do that very accurately? Um, okay, so I'll just leave off with that and be interested to hear in, of any questions. Thanks, Conrad Lee. Um, we said we'd do a Q&A session now. We also have an, a signal angel in the room who will be taking questions on the RIC channel. Um, if there are questions in the room, which I hope there are, I'll take them and uh, we have another audio angel at the back for the back of the room. So please raise your hand if you have a question. Anyone? Come on. One of you has to have a question on this topic. Over there, please. So my question would be, um, you didn't really talk about the possibility of actually asking the users beforehand. So, so why is there not the idea of just asking the users if they would like to participate in the study or not? Because I would believe that you could find enough users who would voluntarily like to participate in the study. Um, yeah, that would be possible. The problem is it's hard to ask people on a large scale. And generally, the, if you ask a very large generic group of people and they don't know who you are, then they don't really, they don't know if you're actually, how you're going to use their data. Um, and they don't really trust you, probably with good reason. So it's hard to collect the data set on a large scale where you have sort of consent of a lot of users, I'd say. There was a question over here. Who was it? Thank you. Hello. Um, I, I also work on that kind of um, subjects and with that kind of data sets. And uh, one of the things I think is most important and that you told is uh, relationships that uh, researchers and uh, big companies like Facebook develop. Because actually nowadays there's not a lot of companies who have that kind of data sets, only, well, Facebook and Twitter mostly. And uh, at the beginning there was, a, they weren't very sure what kind of relationships they wanted with universities and they were perhaps more open than now. But uh, now they ha I feel and I have heard at conferences uh, that they are not really interested in uh, outside research on their data sets and really interested in controlling what the searchers do with their work. So uh, lately a lot of the research that has been going on on these data sets come from people that work directly or indirectly with Facebook, with Twitter. So for the general public it's really a problem because we can't really know on a security or intimacy protection point of view, what really is possible with these data sets, what the marketeers, for example, that the uh, companies that buy those kind of data sets from Facebook or that can access to that kind of information can do with those data. It's really a lot of opacity and that's the main problem, I think. Okay, yeah, I would say even if they were more willing to work with, uh, if industry were more willing to work with academia in, in this area, it would still be the problem. They would just work with one university, and there would be interest, probably interesting research done, but th there wouldn't be replicable. You wouldn't be able to have other academics scrutinize your results. So this is why it'd be nice to have a truly open data set or a few high-quality data sets for different fields. Yeah. Is there anyone else in the room? Yes, over here. Um, there was one point um, I think on your last slide that was about if you know. Um, Yes. Uh, attribute values of 20% of the people, you can infer the rest with 80% accuracy. And is that a statistical value, these 80% or are 80% of these profiles that you calculate then somehow actually correct? Or is that, uh, I can infer that, um, you know, in a, in a network where I know there are almost only women, that I know that uh, statistically most of the others are women too. So is the indiv individual data set um, for one person uh, correct in 80% of the time or is it statistical about the whole network? Okay, um, I forget the details of the, sort of the metric they used there, 
but it wasn't the case that, say, 80% of people were female in this data set, and you just say, then you could come up with a very simple classifier that just says everyone's female, and you'd have 80% accuracy. That wasn't the case. It was, um, it was, yeah, I read the paper and was happy with it at the time. I forget the details on it, but you can look at the, the reference there. It's in the bibliography. Um, I forget which metric they use, though. Anyone with a question? Yeah. Um, isn't there a problem with certain groups being overrepresented in the data set? Because not everyone uses Facebook, and there are some groups who use it more, and some groups who use it less. And isn't this a problem when using the data? Yeah, that's true. So that's why, for example, the the people who created this taste, ties, and time data set, they carefully chose a group of people where nearly everybody used Facebook. They, I think the incoming class, there were 1,600 people, and over 1,500 people had Facebook accounts. So uh, if you chose a group of retired people, you wouldn't have that same kind of participation. So um, yeah, these are, if you're looking at social media in general, you have to make sure that the, the group that you're trying to research is well represented. and be wary of biases that come from different rates of participation. I think there was a, are you raising your hand over here? Thanks. Um, I've got a question about, um, and it's an ethical question. Um, what would you do, or do you know anyone who already did, um, when, an, when a hack of Facebook, for example, would be leaked? So if you've got a data set that's already public and could already be used by malicious um, guys, um, would you use the same data set for um, research? And um, probably the, the answer is no, so why not? Uh, I would say the answer is yes. This Facebook 100 data set has, like I said, is on BitTorrent. And the Facebook 5 data set has been around for a while now. And people have published papers in which they use these data sets. Now, the, those were recently just pulled down. Um, so I don't know, I don't think any of those went through the review process after those, after this flaw had been discovered of the IDs being in there. And they're no longer officially distributed. But uh, there's, it seems that the journals themselves aren't um, denying papers if, they're not like carefully scrutinizing and saying, oh, you've violated privacy in the collection of your data. It's the responsibility of the scientists, the journal themselves don't, they haven't taken on this sort of regulation role. So um, if other groups are researching the data, then your, your research group will be in competition with them. And, and then the groups who will be successful in this field won't have scruples about using those kinds of data sets. Anyone else have a question? Please raise your hand. Yeah, over there. Um, yes, during the past one or two years, there's been an ongoing debate about Facebook privacy and everything. Uh, has this actually contributed to some changes? I mean, what is the current state? Would it be possible to create something like Facebook 1000 with current data or uh, have, has, have the privacy changes actually affected anything regarding academic research? Or was it just about adding stupid and useless JavaScript menus and buttons? So are you asking if the debate about policy has changed Facebook's attitude towards releasing these data sets? Or um, um, yes, uh, if it would be possible for researchers to get a, a current snapshot or a, some sort of current dump of uh, current Facebook data. So uh, Facebook 100, it's uh, a little bit older, but uh, I mean, if the changes in the privacy uh, conditions and everything of Facebook uh, still would allow uh, the creation of a new data set with current data. Okay, I don't think so. Well, of course it would be possible, but it only becomes more and more clear how hard it is to really anonymize this data. And so I think the tendency would be to be more careful with it rather than um, distributing it more, like if you're in the position of Facebook. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the people in Facebook actually think. Anyone else? Don't be shy. 
please raise your hand if you have a question. Anyone? No more questions? Do we have a, questions, a question on IRC? No? Anyone? Now is your last chance. All right, then please give it up for Conrad Lee and his talk.